Hi people, this is Milos and I'm back with another data visualization and GS tutorial which is going to unlock your potential and show you how you can create powerful and effective animated bubble maps with R. This time we're going to be working on conflict data and we'll be creating an animated bubble map of Syrian civil war with a focus on civilian fatalities. In this tutorial, you will learn how you can create these animated bubble maps using ggplot2 and gganimate packages. Without any further ado, let's roll. All right, we are back in R and we are ready to kick off our adventure. But first of all, loading the libraries we need. The way I like to go about this is first of all, define a list of names, library names that I would like to install if they're not there and then also load them into our, our session. First and foremost, we're going to be using a lot of data wrangling here and some also data visualization. And for that purpose, we need an umbrella package called Tidyverse. Tidyverse includes some of the giants, I would say, of this field, such as, for example, Dplyr for a data wrangling, but also ggplot2 for a data visualization. The second one is Gisco R, and we're going to use it to load the national map of Syria uh, because we would need that to create a bounding box. So Gisco R is the next one. Now I said we're going to create the bounding box here of Syria. Uh, bounding box for that purpose, we'll need the asset package or simple features, which is going to allow us to do that. Now, why do we need actually bounding box? Well, we need it because I want to call a layer from uh, ggmap. ggmap is the library that offers you access to uh, Google map layers, OpenStreetMap layers. So you can take them and you can actually print them and uh, create maps in ggplot2. But even better, you can create animated maps. This is what we want. Now to create animated maps, we need gganimates. This is the package that you can use to animate polygons. Uh, you can also animate lines, but you can also animate bubbles or points. And this is what we're going to use in this tutorial. Last but not least, we want our map to be effective and also accurate. So for that reason, we're going to create also legend breaks. For legend breaks, we're going to be using class int package. Now that we define the libraries that we need, we should then see if they are installed. So basically install missing libraries. So the way we're going to check if they're installed, we're going to actually create an object called install libs. Install libs is going to loop through uh, this libs object that we just created. And then using that one, it's going to go, uh, we can go into installed packages. So we can go into installed, uh, installed packages here. And we're going to actually specifically check row names of installed packages. Now, once we actually see if these are installed or they're not installed, we need to make sure that we install those that are not here. So we need an if statement. So we're going to write here if any of the installed libs equals false, then we open curly brackets and we tell R to install packages. Now the question here is what packages? Luckily for us, we define those you know libs. So we're going to uh, install libs, but we're going to install those libs that are not among installed libs. This is how you do it. And then in the last step, we simply load libraries because now we are ready to to do that so installing is also very easy we simply need to use uh, we need to apply to that list and the list here is libs we need to apply the library function which in r is used for uh loading libraries right so this is about it. So once once we do this, we just run this whole chunk. And as I said, this is going to install libraries that are not there. 
and then it's gonna load library. So now we are finally ready to get going and next thing is doing data wrangling in R. Before we jump straight into downloading the data, loading the data set into R and then doing some data wrangling, I shortly wanted to discuss the UCDP conflict data program, the georeferenced event data sets, which is one of the widely used sources of information on armed conflict and political violence worldwide. I use that a lot in uh, my days when I used to be a political violence researcher because this data set provides detailed information on currents, magnitude, location of various types of events, including battles, bombings, riots, and other forms of armed violence. So this place is the place to be if you are a researcher of, of war, conflict, uh, political violence, and those kind of uh, events. So uh, this is the place actually that uh, researchers, policymakers, analysts uh, come to, and uh, it's a very, very often cited in academic research. So in this place, what you can see, there are a lot of things going on, but the most important one is you can of course select here the country of interest, and then it's going to show you, okay, you know what is the violence. So pretty cool. So it has this. Uh, very interactive feature, but for us the most important thing is the data. So if you click on the download button, it will take you to a number of data sets. So one of the most important here, if not the most important, well at least for our purposes, is the UCDP georeferenced event data set that I just mentioned. So click on this one, it's going to take you to this you know, small window with other data sets where you can see what actually is. So it's a highly disaggregated data set with information on locations of, of violence uh, down to the level of villages. So it's very, very precise and down to the level of single individual days. So this will allow us actually to create bubble maps uh, which are, first of all, very precise in terms of the geolocation, but also fine grade in terms of uh, a time. So we can actually choose either days or even weeks or months or years to show, uh, you know, how violence evolves over a certain area over time. To understand this data, uh, it's really necessary to, uh, first of all, enter this codebook. So the codebook will show you uh, first and foremost, you know, what are the you know main variables here? And the codebook itself has a very old fashioned uh, looks. Um, yeah, it's uh, basically a PDF uh, version of the codebook. But for us, the most important thing is this table on page six of this PDF. So this one actually gives us information about the main columns in the table that we want to download. Uh, you know, there are several here uh, and they're very neat and they're actually uh, almost 50 of them. For us, one of the most important things is, of course, this time dimension. So they often they offer a year uh, as an aggregation, but down below you also see they offer a specific date when the violence occurred. There are also types of violence. So this uh, data set is uh, very fine grained in a sense that can determine different types. So whether the government, let's say, you know, um, committed a violent act, whether maybe it's a non-state actor like some, you know, violent group, let's say terrorist group, or maybe it was a one-sided violence, so violence against civilians. So this is the one that we are interested in. In essence, we're interested in any kind of uh, violence that led to uh, civilian death. So we will be considering all three of them in this case. Uh, of course, for different purposes, people want to analyze different things, so then they actually filter those. But that's one of the things that we're interested in here. Here you can also find some descriptive information about the conflict itself. You know, what is the what is the pair of actors that engaged in, in violence? So this diet name. You know, is it a country versus a country, or is it the country versus some non-state group, you know, armed group? So things like that. So if you go down there, uh, you will also see the sources they use. So uh, this is a very cool thing. And usually sources are triangulated, meaning that they take them from different uh, sources, news, uh, reports, institutions, uh, etc. Um, so 
there, uh, then there is one very, very important thing here, which is the location where this took place. So there are three ways to uh, determine the location. One is simply the coordinates, precision of the coordinates of the actual events. Uh, and then the next one is the name of the location to which the event is assigned. Basically, this one can be broader than the first one, which is called where underscore press. Um, and then the final one is simply a description. Sometimes, you know, uh, it's not really possible to determine the exact location. So there is only a description, you know, of a certain region. For us, the most important thing is to take either the first one where, uh, you know, precision, where preci there is precision, or the where coordinates, basically name of the location to which the event is assigned, even though it might not be the completely accurate one. So one of these two is really good for us um, in terms of the location, because we will use this to aggregate. Uh, the second most important thing are coordinates, latitude and longitude. So they're in decimal degrees and also it's not saved here, but they're also WGS84, which is very important as well. So these are also two columns that we're going to need. Now here you can also filter by regions, which is quite cool. So for example, uh, we might want to, you know, have country. So then we can, you know, take the name of the country here. One thing unfortunately is they don't really here include standardized country ID. So ISO 2, ISO 3 code um, are not really here. They use country ID, which is very specific to these days. They just said to is something to pay attention to. Region, on the other hand, is more like, it's not really a continent. It can be also a region uh, in a real sense of the world, like for example, Middle East, that you can see here. But it's also very useful if you wanna just, you know, have data for a specific region. Uh, there are some other things here uh, about the clarity of the event and the date precision. But for us, what is the most important thing in terms of the time of the year is this date star. So this is when the actual uh, event took place. You know, uh, it's called date star and there is date end because sometimes it can be over a prolonged period of time. But for us, we can just take this start date as our you know threshold. And then finally, uh, we can also here gauge the best estimate of civilian deaths. So this is what we're interested in. And this is what we are going to use. So this one is used for non-state or state-based events. So basically, it records the cases of both government-based violence and also the violence by non-state actors, so armed uh, political groups. So this is what we're going to use for the size of our bubble on the bubble plot. And uh, finally, there are some other things here that you can also consider, but in a nutshell, this is the main, you know, th these are the few main columns that we're going to select further on. Now, going back to this main menu from which we access codebook, you can also access the data. So there are four file types here, CSV, Excel, R, and Stata. We could fetch R, uh, in this case, but uh, I might just go for CSV. I'm just used to it. So we are actually going to download the CSV file. So you should actually click right uh, and then copy the link address of this CSV file. And after you're done with that, there is no need for registration or anything. You can just download the raw uh, you know, file. And this is what we're going to do next in so we here have that a link that we just copied, which links to the GED uh, database. And this one would download the entire one that exists there on the UCTB uh, website. So our next step is to define uh, under which file name we're going to download. So uh, we can simply say file name and then we can uh, call it UCDP-GED. Uh, dot zip very important because as, as you can see here this is gonna be a zip file right so that's the first one and then we simply download so downloading can be easily done using the base r function called download file within this one you need to specify three things the first one is the url in our case we already specify url so url equals url the second one is uh, the destination file name so, dest file, 
Uh, we already also defined that, so it's going to be called file name. And then finally, you need to specify the mode of downloading. And the best way that it's not going to throw an error downloading different file types is to use the binary mode. So this one has shorthand WP. Now, once you run this whole thing, the download will start and it will initiate this window, as you can see it here. And after it downloads, it will download 25.4 or so megabytes. But then we need to unzip this file. All right, so what we can just do, we can use the unzip from base R and we say unzip the file name because we already uh, you know, specified it. So it unzipped that one. And then what you can do, you can you know check, for example, you can check your files in your working directory. So what is that was uh, you know unzipped? Uh, but in our case, we already know what is the what is going to be. So I already checked. So this is going to be the file name. Uh, so uh, ged events and then the version twenty three point one, which is the latest one, and then dot uh, csv. So csv is is the file type. So we can simply just unload this CSV file. Let's call it UCTP underscore GED. And let's use from base R read.csv. So here we just need to put uh, this, this file name. And uh, we can also specify the separator here. Why not? So it's comma separated. So we just put here comma. So you put it between those, those quotes. All right, and you can then just uh, load this file, no problem. And once you load this file, it's gonna take uh, a few seconds. Okay, it's done. Now we can uh, simply inspect this. So if you remember uh, from our journey through uh, the UCDP codebook, you probably saw that there's like a lot you know, of columns. We don't need all of them, but let's, for example, for now, let's just see what are the names of these columns. Uh, and then uh, some of them will probably ring the bell. So let me actually increase this uh, terminal output so that you can clearly see. So uh, these are the column names. As you can see, 49, quite a lot. Also, that's uh, quite normal for academic data sets. They have a lot of fine grained information here. For us, uh, some of the most important things are, uh, for example, year. So we could use a year when, you know, the violence happened. That's one of the things that we can use. Uh, the second thing that we can use here is also, uh, you know, date. So when this actually happens, that's also one of the things. But the most important are latitude and longitude, because this will allow us to create bubbles for places where uh, the violence occurred and where there were some, you know, uh, deaths. Because we are here interested in civilian deaths in specific, so how many civilians were killed, we're definitely going to go for column number 43, deaths underscore civilians. Sometimes perhaps they're not going to be, you know, recorded deaths because uh, it did not, uh, you know, happen. Sometimes they won't have information on that. Anyways, one thing that we would like to include here is date start. So this is where the date uh, kicks in. Uh, as I said before, there are other things here. Uh, one also thing that we would probably like to have is uh, the location. So where this incident uh, took place, where the civilians, you know, were killed. So uh, these are some of the things that we want to, you know, get from this data set. So that's going to be our next step. Uh, we will then choose what exactly are the columns we need. And after we choose that, we can uh, go on and uh, finally start, you know, exploring uh, this data and, and plotting it. All right, let's first decide what are the columns that we're going to take next. So one of the first things that we really want here is the location of the violent event. So that would be this where coordinates or column number 26. Then we want latitude, which is column 29, sorry, column 30, and longitude, which is 31. So these actually numbers in these square brackets shows you, you know, what is the number of the element here, the first number of the element for every row. So yeah, we need 30 and 31. 
then we also need uh, the dates of the event happening, uh, taking place. So that would be, you know, date start here. So that is 39. And then finally, we need deaths underscore civilians, which is going to give us the number, if it exists, or the number of, uh, of killed civilians. So this is, uh, these are, you know, the colonies that we're going to select. Also, one of the things here, for this tutorial, we'll be mapping civilian deaths during the Syrian civil war. So we will, first of all, create Syrian uh, data frame or the Syria data frame where we'll just filter, you know, Syria. So let's start off by creating an object called UCDP underscore GED underscore Syria. And we will be working with UCDP GED. So we create a pipe from here. And first thing we use the plier and it option filter. Here, we need to know what is the country name. Now, I'm not sure if they used in this data set just Syria or they used the official name of the country, which is Syrian Arab Republic. The best way to check that is to check the unique values of the country field from this object UCDP GED. The way you do that in R is using a base R function called unique and then calling the column from this UCDP GED, which in our case is so this is how you do it. Okay, let me actually show you quickly. Uh, I can run this. So uh, I can also increase this quickly. So you can see that row 107 says Syria. So I know it's Syria. Uh, the convenient thing about this line that I just uh, ran is you can also check for other countries. The reason why we actually go for country and not country code is as I said before, they don't really use standardized country codes, like internationally standardized, which are ISO codes, ISO 2 and ISO 3. So we need to go for the country name. And country names, as you can see here, they vary a lot. All right, so that's one of the things that I wanted, wanted to show you. We can now continue with writing this, this main code. So as we said, we want to filter by country. So country equals, and then we set Syria. Uh, we also said that we want to select a certain number of columns and it's a really good practice if you can do that every single time to actually decrease the size of the table you work with because it's really going to speed up your analysis and also your data visualization. So uh, we're going to use deployer again and it's uh, function select and now within this one you can either specify the column names that you want to grab or column numbers. Now, because column names means I need to go back again and, you know, like, you know, search for those names. So that's a bit, you know, uh, tough. We already went through the number of columns, though, that we want. So one of them is 26, as we said. So this would be the location name. Then we said we have 30 to 31. These are, you know, latitude and longitude, respectively. And then we had 39 uh, as well which was uh, for the end dates and then finally uh, for the civilian deaths that was 43. All right, so let's just run everything. And once you run this, we can just inspect the few, first few rows of this newly created data frame. For that purpose, I'm also going to use uh, this. So here you can see that we have the location uh, name, latitude, and longitude of the location. We have here for date start actually a timestamp. So we should actually uh, convert this into a proper date. And we also have civilian deaths. Now, for this specific tutorial, I would like us to map um, instances of violence and civilian deaths for the period after the start of the uh, Syrian civil war. So that would be 15th of March, uh, 2011. So that means a rose like this one, where we have uh, an event from 2004, will be removed. Uh, we can then do that immediately. So we can actually continue working on this one, just build a pipe. Uh, so the first step then is to create a date column. And we can use the plier mutate option. 
And then here we can create, let's say, let's call it time. And then we can transform this using as date from base R, date starts. Okay, now we can actually run this once more. And as we run, we can now inspect again so that you can see uh, the field that we just created. All right, so here it is time. You can see it doesn't have uh, hours, uh, minutes and seconds. It only has date formats. So it's, uh, it's definitely a, a date. So that's the first step. We also said that we would like to filter out those dates uh, that happened before 15th of March 2011. So we can then use again filter from the wire and we can use this newly created column time and say that everything we take everything that happened after or on the date of 2011. So here we need to specify as dates and then we provide a string starting from you know the year then going to month and then ending with dates so now we can uh, run again uh, this data frame and then maybe instead of taking the you know the first few values what we can do is summary of values for this uh, you know date column so that you can see what is the minimum and what is the you know maximum so let's do that here and then now we can just uh, increase the terminal so you can see and then summarize uh, the values so you can see here that the minimum value is actually so the earliest date is 18th of march 2011 and the latest one is 31st of december previous year in this tutorial, I would really like us to animate on the monthly level simply because it offers uh, better information on the trends over time than the daily or the weekly level. And also it offers then a mid-level range of analysis compared, let's say, to the yearly level. So uh, to create a monthly level, we need to create actually a new column. Uh, and this column actually is going to be based on that time variables that we created. So let's create month year, and it's going to be equal to this time. Now we need to format this time. So currently it's in a date format. So basically it has the you know year, month, and day. What we need is we need the following thing. It needs to be first a year, which is here signified by capital Y, and followed by month. Now you might be asking yourself. Why didn't I put first month and then year here? Well, that's because once you do this, and once we convert this uh, into this format, actually it's gonna be converted from a date into a string or character. Well, we cannot really work with characters. So then we convert into the next more reasonable thing, which is a factor. And then when you do this, uh, your levels of factors are going to be messed up. They're not going to be ordered if you go first with the month and then a year here. But if you go first with the year and then with the month, they will start from, in our case, you know, March 2011, and they're going to end up with December 2022. And I'm going to show you in a bit why and how this looks like. So. First of all here, we do need to say, uh, we need to uh, declare that time is date. It is the date variable. But as I said before, once we run this, this month here is going to turn into a character. And we don't want to work with character, we want to work with at least factors. So I need to turn this into a factor. And that's how you do it. Now we can run the codes or this chunk once more. And then once we run this, I would really like to inspect the levels of this new factor. So we grab again the name of the data set and then month here. And then once we do that, we can run the levels, but I want to expand this a bit so that you can see the levels themselves. So here are the levels. As I said, they're nicely ordered. So they start from March 2011, go to April, May, June, etc., and they end up in the end they uh, end up with December 2022. All right, so we now have this, and the next step that we need to do here is to basically uh, aggregate. So we have locations, we have months, 
Uh, but what happens currently is uh, our data is organized on the daily level. So we need to aggregate then to the location, specific location and the month. So let's do that. Okay, so we will first of all create a new object, uh, which is going to be UCDPG Syria uh, monthly, so that we know that's the level. And then we're going to put the newly created UCDPG Syria into a pipe. Uh, and then over there, what we need to do is we need to group by. For those of you who are familiar with SQL, this is one of the main things with aggregation. So you first need to decide what are the columns that you want to use to aggregate on. So the first one is location or where coordinates in our case. A bit of a weird name, but I still stick to it because I'm a bit lazy also to change the names. Uh, second thing is coordinates. We also want to uh, aggregate by unique coordinates. Thirds after the coordinates and the final one is actually the month here. So you remember currently it's on the date level and we want to be on the monthly level. Now once you specify this group by, the next thing to do is to say what actually you are going to aggregate. So in our case, what we want to aggregate is uh, the violence, violence against civilians. So for every location, every month, we want to aggregate to sum up. To do that, we need summarize function from dplyr. And then inside of this one, we define a new variable, some violence. And then some violence, of course, will be sum of deaths civilians from our data. Okay, so we now have that. We finally aggregate it. Uh, there are some things that we should also take care of. So as you probably saw before, there are some entries without civilian deaths. So once we aggregate here, we are again going to have some, you know, events without civilian deaths. That's because in this data set, everything, every attack against civilians, every violent event is recorded, irrespective of the number of, of deaths, if any. So what we need to do is, in our animation, in order not to have zeros shown in the legend or at all, we simply need to turn them into uh, missing values. And this is what we're going to do next. This is how you actually do it here in R with the help of dplyr. So we need to do uh, dplyr. And then if you want to create or change the existing variables, you always use mutate. Mutate. So we want to actually just update the existing one. That's some violence. And then we use the base R function, which is called replace. So what do we want to replace? Well, we want to replace some of violence. How you want to replace, or actually what do you want to replace? Well, we want to replace situations or instances where sum of violence equals zero. We want to turn it into missing, which is NA. So this is how, how you do it, actually. All right. So. Uh, then we can just, you know, run this whole chunk that we created. And once we run this, I want to show you uh, uh, the, how this looks like. So let's say the first few rows of this newly created uh, data frame. Yeah, so it's not, not going to be anything, you know, uh, special, but let's uh, do it here. Okay, so here's the thing. So we have here, as you can see, some very weird location, Air Defense Brigade. Uh, this is the longitude and latitude, but you see how it's ordered. So it's ordered for, from 1, 2, 3. So it has some events in, in uh, 2013, and then it doesn't have anything until 2016. So actually, there are events, but there, are no, there was no, you know, any civilian death for these. So maybe it's not a good, you know, example, but there are definitely those that, that have certain values. And we can actually check that right now. This is how we're going to do it. We can again use summary. And then we can summarize from this data set. We can summarize this newly created sum files. Then we can see actually how many of those are, you know, NAs and how many are, are just like have values. It's always good to inspect your data. So yes, so there are a lot of NAs, basically 13K out of 16K, which is totally fine. But for those that do exist here, we see that the minimum is one 
and then median is two, mean is around eight victims, and then we have a maximum, it's almost 900. So this might be something related to ISIS and their uh, massacres of civilians, uh, very, very likely. For us to better understand how our data looks like and also to better visualize it, we should create legend breaks. So for the legend breaks, we're going to use class in package and class in package has a function called class intervals, which allows you to break your data points into a meaningful breaks based on natural intervals. For this purpose, we'll be working with our uh, data frame, UCDP GD Serial Monthly, and with some violence that we just created. Uh, also, in terms of the number of breaks, which is defined by n, I usually go for 6 to 8, and this time I'm gonna go for the lower boundary. And then for the style, I usually go for Jenks, uh, which offers a very reasonable way to create natural intervals. But because we have a lot of data points here, over 20k, uh, I will go for the Fisher, which is uh, the closest one. Uh, and then here we just simply state that we want to actually get breaks object from this. All right, we can just, uh, you know, quickly inspect uh, what we have here. Um, and then based on that, we will see the breaks we have. So we actually have, so the lowest one is one and then it goes to 12, 44, 116. Yeah, and the highest one is 895. Probably has to do something with ISIS massacres in Syria. Now, I also like to define minimum and maximum values of uh, of the data and then to pass it to ggplot2 the reason why i do that is the following so unless you put the minimum and maximum values pass it to ggplot2 once you animate that map what will happen that with every frame because minimum and maximum values will shift uh, also your legend will start changing so to prevent that we can specify limits and then legend will always be in that range so the easiest way is just you can use uh, from base r minimum and then for the minimum, uh, we can just, uh, you know, copy uh, this line because this line is exactly what we need. And because our data also has uh, missing values, we should also specify here to remove those. So uh, na.rm equals true. This is the way to remove. Uh, we can also do the same for, you know, maximum values. So the same thing, we just, you know, copy here and paste here. And uh, we can also run these two. Uh, and yeah, if, if you wish, we can also inspect, you know, what is the minimum. So of course the minimum is one. And then just quickly maximum, 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 maximum is 895, as we saw before. So this is how you create, uh, how to create the breaks. All right, the next thing is to uh, load the Syria national boundaries map from which we will then extract the bounding box. So the reason why we are loading here the Syria shapefile is that we want to create a bounding box. The bounding box is basically just a rectangle that uh, is the frame uh, over your national boundaries, signifying the, the minimum and the maximum longitude and latitude values. Imagine simply if you drew a rectangle around a country, that will be its bounding box. Uh, the reason why we want to have bounding box here is very simple. It's because it's the way that we can get uh, the layer using the ggmap library. So let's get down to business. For that, we use Gisco R, and Gisco R has a function which is called Gisco Get Countries. Within this one, you can specify how crisp your map is going to be, what is going to be the level of detail. We can take one, that's the highest level of detail, which means one to two million in terms of the ratio. And then we can also specify the country. Now, for the country, you can specify either a name, ISO 2 or ISO 3 code. I go for ISO 2 or 3 code because this is something which is standardized. It's not going to change from dataset to dataset, uh, unlike, for example, the you know country name, because in this one might be Syria, but the official name of the country is Syrian Arab Republic. So it's much better to take this one. All right. I also noticed recently that uh, upon using uh, this code get a countries that returns an error and then uh, it tells me actually to cache uh, and to update the cache of the map that I maybe previously downloaded. So I'm actually going to do this also here like this. And you might also want to do this 
in case you know you face a similar issue so cache equals true uh, and then also update uh, underscore cache equals true as well uh, and then we don't actually need the national boundaries we need a bounding box so for that reason we can call uh, sf package and then st uh, b box which is gonna then create just a bounding box here so we can just run this code and then I'm actually going to show you how the bounding box of Syria, what the bounding box of Syria is, how it looks like. So you see it has these columns which signify the minimum and maximum longitude long, uh, latitude values where X is longitude, Y is latitude. And then the next row is the actual values. So uh, that's what it is. So for us, we actually need to extract those things, put it into a list, and then we can pass it to ggmap. So let's create a list which is going to be called Syria Quartz. In Syria Quartz, uh, we need to pass to ggmap in a certain order. So it needs to start with uh, this x min or x minimum, and then goes to y minimum, then x maximum, y maximum, exactly the way it was ordered in the beatbox that I just uh, show you. So uh, because we do have a list, the Syria beatbox is a list or actually it's called Syria SF in our case, we do need to extract it. And this is the way to extract the values. So we can simply just copy this for other uh, values. As we said, the next one is Y minimum uh, and then followed by also uh, X maximum and Y maximum. Yeah, that's about right. So these are the values and yeah again we can just you know extract those what we will see now is nothing revolutionary simply a list uh so we pass it to the list because ggmap you cannot really pass that you know uh bounding box object that we previously had so for that purpose uh we can now use this so here is how you can work with ggmap let's call uh, our ggmap syria and from ggmap there's three options, or actually there are several options for the layers. So you can use the uh, Google Maps layer. It has several ones like satellite, terrain, uh, streets. Uh, I don't like using that one. I think it has a lot of color level of detail. And also I'm not even sure if it can be loaded. You probably need to have an access to the API. So some key. Uh, the next one is OpenStreetMaps. Uh, it also has a lot of detail and might not be what we are actually looking for. Uh, there are two more and one of them is actually uh, stamen or stamen. I'm not really sure how it's how it's pronounced. So uh, uh, stamen maps or stamen maps, uh, they have very minimal level of detail. And uh, as I will show you, they actually have pretty nice also labels and everything is kind of a black and wild, although you can also choose to have terrain in color. We're gonna go for a very simple version black and white with labels of towns and also the major roads as well as country boundaries and for that we will use get uh, get stamen or stamen map all right and then we will pass that syria ports that we just created so it knows okay this is actually the rectangle for which i need to you know download the data and then very importantly for zoom now for zoom this is a bit of a hidden miss so if you choose a lower zoom, what will happen is that you will get a low level detail. In a sense, you might not get any labels or major roads or anything. You might just get a map of Syria, which is like Syria with a label over it. If you choose, however, a very high one, let's say 12 or 15 or whatever, anything over 10, it's going to give you actually a lot of detail, but you might need to wait for minutes, if not like, you know, tens of minutes to get this downloaded because this one needs to fetch it actually from the server. In this case, I'm going to go for eight, which is going to offer a lot of detail. Uh, in this case, uh, at most importantly, actually, it's going to offer you labels, uh, rows and everything. So I'm going to actually show you that in a bit. And then you can choose map type. If you go to the ggmap, you know, uh, websites, or if you go actually to its uh, codebook on, on CRAN, you will see there are different map types. So I'm actually going to stick to this one, Toner uh, 2011. 
But there's also uh, other ones like there is stoner, uh, you know, terrain. There is also just terrain, different ones which show you actually different options. And there, are, some of them are really really cool. But this one I think offers a nice political map of Syria with simply you know town names and and roads. So once you have this, uh, and once you run this, I just want to show you like I don't know if you can actually see this, how this looks like, but uh, if you run this, you will see that it's now patching map tiles, and then you can see that okay, it got it from OpenStreetMaps this stem and design. It's a very minimal design. So if you want to actually see how this looks like, you can simply use uh, a GG map, and then you can just call Syria object that we just created. So uh, once you do that. Uh, you will see uh, a very nice plus. So let me show you. Okay, real quick, this is the national map of Syria that we got from uh, that GG map option. So this is the one that has labels, it has uh, roads, major roads, even at this level of detail, some regional boundaries, and of course, the national boundary of Syria. In black, you can see actually a, a large bodies of water. So there is Mediterranean on the you know, left hand side, but there's also some you know, lakes here in Syria. So uh, that said, we can now finally move on to ggplot2 and first create a static map using all those components that we so far gathered. Okay, people, let's create this static map first. Let's call it map monthly. And this time we're not going to call ggplots because if you're using ggmap, it serves actually as this main layer. It performs the function of calling ggplots in, in brackets. But you do need to here specify what is the data. So in our case, it's called Syria. Then we add the next layer. So this time, because we are working with data frame, we need to use geom points and not geom sf. And within geom points, we need to specify our data, which is UCDP uh, GD Syria monthly. But we are going to have a static, so we're going to create additional layer, which are going to be the points. But within these points, we need to specify three things. First of all the x-axis or actually the, the longitude so this is going to be longitude then we need to specify the y-axis which is latitude and finally we are going to show the size of the points so we need to specify the size here and the size will be according to the violence of against civilians now you might be wondering why are we not specifying here color for example or fill this is because it's going to confuse people uh, if they have to look at two dimensions. So both the size and the color. So I opt actually only for one. And in this case, because I want to show the magnitude of violence, I find that the size is more appropriate. But that doesn't mean that we cannot specify, you know, what is going to be the, that we cannot really fill uh, those uh, points with a certain color. We can do, but we can actually specify one that it's going to be you know, uh, constants across all the bubbles. So when you say violence, people usually think about, you know, a red color, but this time I opted for pink. I think red is too strong. I mean, we all know here that uh, this bubble map is showing violence against civilians. So there is no point to exaggerate this information even more. And then finally, because I would like these points to be very well seen, I'm going to put alpha here to one. So this is the transparency level. If you put it to zero, it means that your bubbles are going to be completely transparent. One means that they're not going to be transparent at all. So this is what we need. Because here we specify the size uh, in our aesthetics, we need to also define the parameters for size. So what kind of size are we talking about? For that, we need to use scale size from ggplot2. Uh, and then here we can specify several things. Well, first one we can do is breaks. So we can do breaks. You remember our breaks have decimal places? Well, we can actually round them. So let's round them. Uh, and in our case, that would be, you know, breaks and round to, to uh, zero places, right? Uh, we can also specify limits if you remember. So we already, you know, specified the min and, and the max for our minimum and maximum 
uh, uh, values. And then finally here, you can also specify the title of your legend. Let's call this one uh, Civilian Deaths or Civilian Fatalities, whatever you prefer. Or you can also leave it empty. If you want to leave your title empty, you can just like delete like this. Uh, all right, so these are the things that concern the main layers. We can also a bit specify the legend, we've customized it. For that, you use guides. And you need to specify it here for what aesthetic category you're using it. Since we have one, which is size, then we are specifying guide legend uh, for, for the size. Within these brackets, you can do several things. So I would like this legend to be vertically aligned and I would like it to be somewhere on the right hand side. Uh, because there are not met many actually, you know, Syrian towns, large towns in, in the east. They're mostly in the west, on, uh, close to the coastline. Uh, and also what I would like to do is, I would probably also like to then shift a bit the labels and everything. And we can also do that. So here is the thing. So we can do, first of all, the direction, which is going to determine the direction of our, you know, legend. We can put it to vertical. Then if you want to manipulate the title, you use title and then dots. First of all, I want to manipulate the position of the title. I want it to be on the top. Second, uh, I would also like to manipulate the horizontal position of the title. So you also use title.hjust. Uh, for that, I would like it to be in the middle, so 0.5. If you want it to be left justified, you would use 0. If you want it to be right justified, you would, you would uh, use 1. So the values vary from 0 to 1. Same way we manipulate its uh, title, we can also manipulate, uh, uh, you know, uh, labels. So label.position, that's the, that's the name. Labels, uh, we can actually keep them on the right hand side. And then we can also specify the label it's just we can uh, leave it on the left side so uh, zero here uh, number of columns we can go for uh, number of columns one since it's a vertical one and we can also specify that we want it to be organized by row one of the things that we can also probably add, I'm going back now to the scale size, is actually what is going to be the size, the range of the sizes, potential sizes here. So we can specify, let's say, from 1 to, let's say, 12. That's also possible to do within the scale size. Okay, once we are done with this, we actually come to the last part, which is theme. I like to start with the void theme because it gets rid of all this excess, you know, uh, elements in the background and then within the theme itself I like to specify further some things for example we can specify legend position in our plots and I would like the legend to be on the right hand side as I said before you can play with this one as well uh, we can also specify here legend text uh, so legend text uh, if you're working with text so it can be legend plot uh, title plot subtitle captions you need to specify element underscore text so that ggplot2 knows what you're dealing here exactly with. And then within this option, you can then specify, for example, size. Let's go for 11 text size. You can specify color. Let's, for example, go for, uh, you know, charcoal gray. What else can you specify here? You know, you can also specify other things like, you know, position, this and that. But I think we'll just leave it at, at this. So the same way you did uh, for the legend text, you can also do it for the legend title. Uh, for the legend title, you can then specify to be a bit, you know, bigger than this. Uh, in fact, we can actually make the legend even uh, legend text even bigger. But I leave it to you to your good judgment about that. So uh, the same way we did the the legend title, we can also do, for example, plot title. So plot title. We can specify something that is much bigger than this let's say size 20. think of sizes you open for example microsoft word or something like that those kind of you know sizes pixel sizes so uh, we can leave this as as trial for gray but we can also uh justify the the title so put 0.5 and we can also move it a bit up so that it doesn't not really overlap with the map so we can go for the work code vertical 
uh, justification of let's say three if you chose the negative value here then it would move closer it's it works the same way like everything in ggplot in terms of you know south that's negative and then you know north that's positive also like west that's negative and then east these are positive uh, numerical values uh, so we have title now in the subtitle we will be showing our you know month years so it's very very important that we specify here and i will go for a, a even bigger subtitle so size 40 and also i would like to align the color uh, with that color that we previously you know defined that's uh, the that pink color so it stays stays in the same uh, you know way uh, and then for uh, for the subtitle, I could leave three and maybe just title move a bit higher than the, than the subtitle. Uh, apart from these things, we can also specify the caption. Uh, within the caption, we usually just put you know data source, maybe the author name. But this one is smaller, and uh, we can also go here for some kind of a gray, let's say uh, gray uh, forty. Uh, it can also be, uh, you know, horizontally justified. And if I choose minus 10, then it's going to be a bit lower uh, from the map. So we make sure just it does not overlap with the map. Finally, we can also define here margins. Uh, well, because I want to, you know, because I want to move a bit, uh, I want to move a bit, you know, the legend to the right. I want to also create some space on the right hand side. So uh, the way you, you work with margins is the following. First of all, you specify uh, unit arguments. And then here you provide a list of four elements. So how much the top is gonna change? I say we don't change anything. Right hand side, perhaps we should you know give it a bit more space, let's say three. Then um, what else is there? Bottom, which is B, we also might not change anything. And then left hand side, we also might not change anything. Uh, let me just briefly explain this. So positive values means that you're expanding. Negative values means you're shrinking. And zero means basically does not change at all. And finally here, you need to specify units. I'm just gonna go for lines. This is what I usually uh, choose in this case. So this would be the, the, the theme. Now there is one last part that we can define, which is actually some of the labels in our uh, plots. Uh, some of them, for example, we don't need. So for example, the axis titles, we don't need them, but we need, for example, the title. So we need to specify what's going on here. We can say, for example, civilian deaths in the Syrian civil war. Uh, and then for caption, we can also specify that. We can say data source, uh, UCDP, GED. And I think the version is, the current version that we're using is 20.1 or so. Um, if it's not, I mean, it's worth going back to the website, just checking and then, you know, giving you proper credit. And last but not the least is subtitle. And this is where we're gonna, gonna tell our ggplot2 that we are actually working here, we're gonna animate this. So the way you do that is the following. You open this curvy brackets, and then you say here, closest state. All right, closest state. Now, once you do that, uh, what is very, very necessary here is to wrap this up into another set of brackets and then depending on what is what is what that you're using what is the class of that object then you specify here what it should be so in our case for example month year is a factor so we're going to put here as factor so you need to pass it to this if you're using day for example it might be a date so here then you would be putting as date for the year it might be integer so it would be as numeric you get what i'm hitting at so you need to, uh, based on what you are passing here to be the, the column to change the frames, you need to uh, then determine here what it is. All right. So basically that's it. This is the, you know, the code, it's quite lengthy. And we can then run this code. And after we run the code, we can also print this map. So print map monthly. 
and then I'm going to show you what we got. Alrighty, so this is our static map of civilian deaths in the Syrian civil war. And you can notice now that they are exactly, you know, over the map of Syria, which tells us that we got also the coordinates reference system right. Uh, you can also see that all the data points are here, which is not going to be the case once we animate the map. Then you will see only for specific month, years, certain amount of violence. Also, you see this very weird subtitle. That's because, uh, you know, ggplot2 is simply printing what we offered. But in the later stage, in the next steps, we're actually going to add some more ggAnimate arguments, which are going to then actually turn this uh, map into a number of other static maps and then pull them together into a, a GIF file. And after that, we're going to have our animated map. So let's do that next. And now we can finally animate our static map using GG Animates. So let's name this object time lapse map monthly. And then we can use map monthly and then just add to it from GG Animates transition states because we did use uh show states argument over there so over here we need to pass what is actually the you know the column that is going to be used to change frames so it's month year and after that you can specify some optional things so one of them is for example how long is every transition going to be so every state that we animate here and the you know default one is one but i want to extend it just like bits uh, and then finally you can also do how long is going to be the breaks between these different states and this one i'm just going to go for default one i don't want to create too long breaks in between different states i also like pretty much uh fade in and fade out effects so for the fade in you just uh, use enter fade uh, and then for the fade out effect, use exit underscore fade. And then as a final thing, you can also specify what is going to be the actual way of showing your animation. So this is called uh, ease AES or ease aesthetics. And over here, there are many things, but I tend to, when I'm working bubble maps especially, I tend to use a linear, linear one. But you can check out uh, other ones on the specifically dedicated website for GG Animate. You will also find, you know, like cubing ones, also cubic in, cubic out. So there are different, you know, also uh, variants of, of these uh, aesthetics. Some of them are smoother, some of them are less smoother. And then also here you can define how long is going to be interval between different you know, states. So the higher the number it is, the longer the break is going to be. So basically your animation is going to be also longer. And the shorter it is, the shorter the state, but also the shorter the animation. So 0.2 is something that I usually go for, 0.2, 0.25. Okay, so I would call this a continuation of ggplot2. We put it separately from ggplot2 just a bit to declutter that part, which is a really the, the static map. And now, once we define this, we can really move to the nuts and bolts of animation customization. For that, we're going to create this object called animated map monthly. And then within this one, we can call uh, ggAnimate and animate function. Within this one, we are going to pass this newly created time lapse map monthly, where we define some global animation functions. Now over here, uh, you can define several things. One of them is the number of frames that we're going to have. So because we have uh, around 140 or 150 months, uh, so basically, yeah, 10 or like maybe even like 11 years time 12, we do want to have more frames. So let's say we go for 150 frames. We could even go for, for more. 
but let's say we go for 150 frames i'll leave it up to you to also customize these options as you see fit for the duration i will not go for something lower than 20 seconds i know that the, this animation is specific this is a bit short time for it so you will see uh, that uh, all those frames all those mount gears they're going to change pretty rapidly if you're bothered with that feel free simply to increase the duration and also the number of frames that's also fine this is simply for the demonstration purposes i'm showing you what actually you can do you can also define if there is going to be some kind of a break or a pause at the beginning of the frame so that you don't immediately jump into animation and i always like to start with some at least a short break at the beginning and you can also freeze the last frame for that you can use this end pause and for that i use something much much longer so like 30. Uh, you can also define resolution i go for 300 pixels you can go higher if you wish and you can also define here what is going to be the size of your uh, file because i like to use inches i'm going to specify units as inches but you can choose different ones so it doesn't need to be inches it can also be you know centimeters if you if you feel like that's something that you can work with or you can also specify pixels so uh, then we specify width so for the width uh, I would go for something a bit longer so let's say 7.5 and then height for 7 because uh, indeed Syria does look a bit longer than it looks taller so to say you can also specify here frames per second that's FPS arguments let's go for let's say 15 and finally you can choose your renderer i like to go for gipsky renderer uh, in this case but there are other ones which you can also check uh, on the, the website for gg animates and then we can here to say that we want to create an eternal loop okay so these are the steps that we want to take and then finally the last last step is to save this animation once it's done so for that we will again call gg animate and this one is anim underscore save here you specify the name of your file so let's say violence versus civilians syria and then it's going to be a git file so we're just going to specify this and finally, what is the object that we want to you know, animate? So that's uh, that's animated map monthly. That's about it. So we can now run these things. And I'm actually going to bring this terminal a bit up because I want to actually check what is going on. So this is the first thing where we uh, actually plug in these global uh, animation settings for the transition uh, between states and this is a more important one because this is actually where we're gonna animate things so if i run this part uh, if i run this part we're gonna wait a bit here and then it starts rendering so this is the first stage where it actually you know starts uh rendering the, the scene itself after this one what will happen is it's going to start creating images for every frame and then in the final stage it's going to put them together right and then create this gif file that we have and then we just need to uh, finally run this portion once this rendering and put it together everything is done and then we will have you know the final gif file okay so here it is the map of the syrian civil war and civilian deaths in specific as you can see it is quite quite fast but you can readjust it uh hopefully following the my instructions um you can also see how you know uh violence over time it just like uh slows down it becomes you know uh less frequent and less violent um if you however want to change anything you can go back to gg animate and, and do that this simply offers you like a broader view of what can be done with uh, gg animate hopefully you will be able to follow in the footsteps and create some really awesome 
uh, bubble maps. All right, that's all for today, folks. In today's tutorial, we covered quite a bit on animating bubble maps, and we also used very cool georeference data from UCDP but I'm looking so much forward to your own maps and also what kind of other data you can bring in and create effective bubble maps with R. Well, if you're interested in just replicating today's map, feel free to check the link below to my repo. Feel free to clone it, reuse it, modify it as you see fit. If you have any comments, questions or feedback about this tutorial other tutorials feel free to reach out to me here on youtube but also on instagram and twitter if you're new to r and you would really like to expand your data visualization and gis skills in r i really encourage you to check out some of the previous tutorials that i did see you next time